Hello ladies and gentlemen and welcome back to yet another video on the YouTube channel. Um, by the fact that you can see my ugly mug, you should already know that this is going to be a little bit of a different video. So, just a little bit uh, to preface this, uh, Black Ops Zombies, or Call of Duty Zombies, I guess, has been one of my favorite game modes since I was about 10 years old. I used to, you know, go over to friends' houses every night so I could play it when my dad said the game was too violent. You know, I eventually figured out that I could download the game, and no matter how many times he deleted it, I could just reinstall it, and he didn't figure out that there were controls to prevent that before I uh, shut him down. So, you know, I've been playing the game for, you know, eight, almost nine years now. Um, I absolutely love the game. I've loved all the game modes. I have such good memories of Black Ops 2. Shadows of Evil is my all-time favorite map, followed probably by Zetsubo no Shima, making Black Ops 3, in my opinion, the best DLC season. And then we move on to Black Ops 4, which is going to be where today's video is taking place. More specifically, I ran into a little bit of an issue. I The other day, one of my friends, one of the people I met through the Zombies community, specifically the Black Ops 4 Zombies community, that might be relevant later, um said he, he we were playing zombies and he said you know he uh, saw an interesting video he saw a video that really stood out to him and that he thought i should watch that video was tim hansen's review of dead of the night and i said okay i'll watch it i'll give it a try because you know tim hansen's content is usually pretty funny um i usually enjoy it i enjoy what he does with crazy rabbit i enjoy you know kind of the fun custom maps the fun little challenges that he does i think it's a different spin on the game that we haven't really seen before um that being said, I sat down to watch the video expecting, you know, great things as I do for most of Tim Hansen's content, and was pleasantly surprised to see what is, in my opinion, one of the most enraging and appalling videos I've ever seen. That being said, I'm going to try to keep my personal opinions out of the video uh, beyond this point that is, of course, from the time we hit the play button on Tim Hansen's video, which you guys are going to see in the bottom right-hand corner throughout the entire duration of this recording. And we are going to really just try to hammer in on facts. We're going to try to hammer in using statistics, using the map layout, etc. To just sort of explain why this map is actually not all that bad. And in fact, pardon me, uh, not sponsored by the way. It is a masterpiece, in my opinion, to rival shadows or zetsubo at least if not even put up on the pedestal with their eyes and drock with origins with mob of the dead um so without further ado let's just go ahead and start Hello the video and thank you for joining me on this beautiful saturday or sunday evening depending on how long i managed to procrastinate talking about black ops 4 zombies today our subject is of course dead of the night you may have scrolled past this video paused went back and realized I forgot this map existed. I don't blame you. I did the same thing. I woke up this morning and I remembered I got to talk about Dead of the Night for a couple of hours. First off, thank God this video is only 16 minutes. But uh, beyond that, this this entire sort of uh, intro spiel leads up to him saying the map is a bad map. Um, that piece of information is obviously an opinion. It's not important at all to reviewing the map. And this first segment of the video, which takes up about a sixth of the total runtime actually, is very circular. He's going to mention forgetting about the map three times, back to back to back, a couple more times even, and constantly belaboring points like that is often a tactic that people use when they're trying to forcefully sway somebody's opinion, meaning like when they don't have the legitimate logical grounds, when they don't have sort of any claim to expertise on the topic, but they still want to sway people's opinions. So let's just continue here. I forgot this map even existed. I thought we were doing Ancient Evil next. First impressions are everything. If you reach across the table and spill water all over a girl on your first date, you're probably not getting a second one because in her mind, you're just a careless fool who doesn't even know how to use his own arms. And when you really think about it, DLC 1 is the ultimate first impression. Alright, traditionally speaking, this is of course maybe not in my experience, but traditionally speaking, the first date is an opening to somebody romantically. It's growth in a relationship from friends, from acquaintances, from, you know, possibly even, like, having just met somebody, like, saw somebody attractive on the street, maybe, uh, to potential romantic partners. It's obviously not a guarantee of any sort, and while this may now take the form of a Tinder pickup line, the point is that a date serves as the opening to a relationship, and honor not also given a DLC 1. There's a lot that comes before the first DLC in any Call of Duty Zombies, especially in any Call of Duty Zombies season. 
um, that begins that relationship. Things like maybe the announcement of the game, the release of some zombie-specific trailers, some gameplay trailers, the promise of new multiplayer features, the promise of, you know, upgrades to the existing zombies game mode as we know it. And I'll be honest, from what I remember, the reception of the Voyage of Despair and Nine trailers, which if you recall were actually combined into one map, or into uh, one trailer, and it looked like we might even be able to go from map to map, they were incredibly well received. Um, you know, everybody just loved them. They were so excited for the game when it first came out. The launch content doesn't have to be extraordinary. It just has to be good enough. Because This is not true, um, Tim. This is just not true. And it's so far from the truth that you will actually disprove it. By the way, remember this statement. Remember that Tim says the launch content doesn't have to be extraordinary. Um, because as he lays out his argument, the foundation for his assault on Dead of the Night here, he's actually going to um, be disproving this statement. So I'll reference it in the future, of course, as he does, in case you guys have forgotten. People are typically enamored with the game being new. The game is fresh and exciting, but it's around DLC 1 when that feeling begins to wear off and people are expecting new and better content. DLC 1 is the ultimate first impression. If DLC 1 flops, the rest of the game is not going to go well. And that's exactly what happened with Black Ops 4 Zombies. Dead of the Night was an awful first impression. I mean, don't get me wrong, some of the launch maps are atrocious. I am not a big fan of Voyage of Despair or Blood of the Dead, but the fact that the game was new and everything was fresh about it sort of overrided that. It's like getting a brand new car. You're enamored with it. You're excited about it. First off, if we are to sort of continue drawing the lines of the uh, subjective and unsubstantiated statements being made thus far, the launch content in Black Ops 4 is bad. It's not something to be enamored with. It's just bad. One map you consider mediocre in 9 and two maps that you find deplorable doesn't add up to something that you're enamored with like, say, a new car. Uh, it, in fact, adds up to something that you would probably throw in the trash, more like, for those of us who pre-ordered Fallout 76, the game at launch was nothing you know, compared to what it is today. Something that, you know, despite having launched and despite being hyped up, we weren't enamored for. That being said, that exper er, um, that example is largely tangential, doesn't really matter to the review. Um, I just wanted to throw that out there as a quick idea back to the video. And it's not until a couple of months later that you begin to realize that you actually don't love the color of it. You can get away with one poor all right. launch map. All right, all right, all right. Let's just be clear here. Cars usually cost, at the bare minimum, $5,000, right? And as you go up the list, you get towards, you know, 10, 20, 50, even $100,000. Now, when you're throwing that much money around, there is absolutely no excuse for being so hasty as to not put thought into the color, put thought into every detail. Even, you know, the tiny crease on the interior leather, right? That, like these are all things that you need to think about when you're making such big investments as you go on in life um, and you know taking the car without the color right looking at the rest of the car and saying this is amazing I'll take it but not thinking about the color on the outside it's like thinking about the maps without their design really it's like thinking about like just maybe the core shapes of the maps right without the uh, design features, without the intentionality that builds them up, that builds up the atmosphere, that builds up the color, that really sort of takes the car to the next level, takes the map to the next level. Um, and Black Ops 4 has done actually an amazing job of allowing players creativity through its design. The perks, for example, are intentionally designed to give you immense choice which is something made clear with like Blaze Phase, with Ethereal Razor, even to some extent with Blood Wolf. Um, and of course, to, to cap it all off, Secret Sauce. Uh, all of these perks provide, you know, potential incredible offensive and defensive tools, but they would not have survived. They pale in comparison to the crutch that Juggernaut was, to the powerhouse of Widow's Wine, to, you know, the just passive benefits of Speed Cola, of Stamina Up, of Double Tap, of Quick Revive. The classic perk system really overshadows these, and it, all, in all honesty, it's, it kind of oppresses the player. Like, when you play zombies, you don't pick different perks. Not only do you usually only have eight to pick, but of those eight, I mean, at the very least, most players consider Juggernaut essential, right? 
Whereas in Black Ops 4, um, if you were to take that sort of creativity of design, you can actually see that like Black Ops 4, whew, Black Ops 4 will give you not only the different paint colors that you need to choose from for your car, right? But it'll also give you like a unique warranty to change out that paint color whenever you want. To just wake up one day and say, you know what, I don't feel like playing this game the same way today. To pop Ethereal Razor into your modifier slot and to go melee zombies for 30 rounds straight. Right? Like that's, I mean, you can even melee Blightfathers. Like it's the, the creativity that Black Ops 4 gives you is absolutely incredible. Let's continue though. Map. You can't, however, get away with a poor DLC 1 map because, like I said, DLC 1 is the very important first impression. It sort of gives you an idea as to what the rest of the game is going to be like. And Dead of the Night was a very poor first impression. But how? You may be wondering. How was Dead of the Night a bad first impression? It all begins with marketing. For those of you who are wondering, the point of marketing is what actually continues for a sixth of the runtime of the whole video specifically, and it's true that Dead of the Night flew under the radar in terms of what it got from Treyarch, in terms of the public love it got from Treyarch, but this point is repeated more than three times again with the same sort of effect of um, sort of trying to get it to barge into the heads of, of the viewers and make it sound like a slight against the map, whereas if anything, it's a reflection on a breakdown of communication between Treyarch and the um, now largely archaic and potentially harmful parent company of Activision. Um, you know, furthermore, it's, it's really just understandable that Dead of the Night of all maps is the one that's gonna have this issue because they have a celebrity cast for that map. And while the devs at Treyarch are invested usually in one project and one project alone, they can actually sit down in the morning. They can actually say, today we're working on this, right? Um, there's a much bigger issue at hand when you're working with celebrities. Because, like, celebrities might voice a character here. They might do a TV show there. They might cameo somewhere else. You know, I mean, they're all over the place, honestly. I can't imagine being a celebrity. Their lives are crazy. Um... And so it can be a lot harder to track them down. By the way, pardon that beep, I don't actually know what it was, but um, it can be a lot harder to track them down when you need them for something like recording voice lines or even for re-recording voice lines if something sounded a little bit off. So it's completely understandable that Treyarch would be a little hesitant in hyping up this map because there's potential that they need to push it back. I mean, there's potential that something out of their control causes it to need to be pushed back and the issue with that is that the player base won't unanimously see beyond the fact that the map was delayed, right? So, like, it's reasonable to kind of tone down the marketing when you're using a celebrity cast just to account for the potential uncertainty to sort of provide yourself a safety net to fall back on, right? Back to the video. Where the fuck was it? It's sort of a given that before you release a brand new zombies map to the public, you release some sort of trailer or some sort of cutscene in advance to get people excited, to get people hyped for the map. Because the last thing you want is for people to be not only unaware, but unexcited for a zombies map. For example, DLC 1 of Black Ops 3 Zombies, Der Eisendrak. Weeks in advance before the map launched, you had trailers, epic trailers that were getting people excited, got people talking about the map. And it also just so happened that Der Eisendrak is one of the best maps of all time, Therefore, DLC 1 was successful. Therefore, the rest of the game was successful. Dead of the Night. All right, I'm just gonna stop this man right here. First off, saying that one thing is good and another thing is good, therefore they're linked, is a common misconception, okay? How's this, how's this for an example, right? Because the women's rights movement is good and because chicken pot pie is good, the two are unquestionably linked. Right, chicken pot pie would not be as good if women's rights hadn't happened, if the women's rights movement hadn't happened in the, you know, mid 1900s in America, that is. I can't speak for the rest of the world because I live in America. Um, and obviously, America is America is Americentric. And so, you know, we learn about America more than anything else in our history classes. Well, the United States specifically, but that's beyond the point. The Awakening DLC was released to PS4 on February 16th, 2016, and the Xbox One exactly one month later. Almost immediately following these releases on April 1st, 
of the same year, there was a free weekend to try out the Rock. There were no sales statistics posted. There was no press coverage. There was no sort of like initial boom of success on the internet that, that echoed around about the Rock between its launch period on PlayStation and its um, this April 1st date. Which means, if anything, a conclusion that's safer to draw is that DLC 1 initially failed. Der Eisendrock, the Awakening DLC, initially flopped. And Treyarch responded to it with a free weekend, which is then kind of what drummed up the sales, right? Um, and led the map to the previously mentioned notoriety. I mean, even I can't deny, as much as I find the map boring, that it's on a pedestal. Like, it's one of the highest regarded maps in the Zombies community. I can't argue that point. Um... And the point is further defended by, like, the fact that DLC packs which saw strong releases, such as the one containing Origins and Zombies Chronicles and Black Ops 3, both had mountains of coverage on the internet. They penetrated the front page of Google News. You know, they, they showed up on gaming shows. They showed up on talk shows. They showed up everywhere. Like, even probably, there were probably even releases about on Activision's website through Activision's social media about how amazing the DLC was doing. A trait which is noticeably absent in Awakening. Um, so just just keep that in mind as we continue comparing DLC 1 to, of Black Ops 4 to its Black Ops 3 counterpart. Knight, on the other hand, did not mark it. They did absolutely everything in their power to not get people excited, to not get people hyped for this experience. Not one trailer, not one gameplay trailer, that is. I do believe they may have uploaded the intro cinematic on YouTube one day in advance. I'm not even sure about that, but that's clearly not enough. The nail in the coffin to this issue, to this argument, fundamentally, is the fact that the map was riddled with release issues from, like, from a variety of sources, noting that the Australian Black Ops Pass owners actually got the map a full 24 hours in advance. Um, like, already downloaded, no download times. They had full, unrestricted access to the map a day in advance. To the fact that a former Reddit and 4chan user who was once employed by Treyarch leaked the entire map, Easter egg steps and side quests included, weeks before, up to a month before the map was properly released. If there was any map that got enough marketing under the philosophy that all press is good press, it's this map. The gaming section of Google News was flooded with articles about the leaks. Uh, there were YouTube videos, there were tons of Reddit posts, you know, the the platforms blew up in their respective communities talking about this new map, talking about everything that was leaked, and caused what I could only imagine to be an absolute nightmare in the PR, in the PR section of Treyarch, right? The map essentially marketed itself as people sort of kept continuing to push out this content in a sort of viral, frenzy, frenzied manner, while Treyarch had to sit back and instead of, you know, preparing release trailers, take down videos, flag videos, take down news articles, contact news sources, right? You know, to kind of minimize this issue, to negate the issue that was caused by what's most likely a breach of NDA. Um, for this reason, I personally, I'm not going to talk about marketing anymore because... I honestly think that they that there was a store there was a completely excusable storm of issues that both marketed the map and prevented it from needing proper or and diverted Treyarch's attention from marketing it properly like many other maps. Um, of course, Tim is going to continue to talk about this for, like I said, a sixth of the total runtime of this video, uh, which is just absolutely absurd in my opinion. Even if that was the case, they didn't upload any trailers, they didn't post anything on Twitter or Instagram regarding it. If you weren't around during this time, I kid you not, they literally just released the map. That was it. Nobody was expecting it. Not one person. Which is obviously a major issue and a major contributor as to why this map failed and why the rest of Black Ops 4 failed. As someone who plays Black Ops 4 on a daily basis, or a near daily basis, which I personally do, by the way, I can say that this is that this game is not in a worse position than any other Treyarch Zombies title, especially not currently. There are still public matches, like you can actually get into the public queue and search for any map in the game and find a match within a reasonable amount of time. Um, there are a plethora of active Discord communities, PlayStation communities, I'm assuming Xbox communities as well. Um, I don't own an Xbox, so I can't obviously speak to those personally, 
but those communities help counteract the game's, you know, lackluster matchmaking. Like, I, I can't deny that the matchmaking system in the game doesn't seem to always pick best to pick best host, and it doesn't seem to always match players based on level, based on geography. Um, and it, it, there's also not an option to, you know, only match with people with mics, let's say. Like, there, there, it could be a much, much, much more robust, robust system, don't get me wrong. But for what we have, there's actually an incredibly active community to the point where, like, if I want to find a lobby to run an Easter egg, I'm running an Easter egg within half an hour. doesn't matter what map it is. Um, which I hardly consider a failed game or a dying community. As a result, because people didn't have enough time to absorb and get excited for the map. Any successful Zombies map had some sort of trailer in advance. Except for maybe Nocturne Toten, because it was the first map ever. But you get my point. Without marketing, you're eliminating all hopes of someone on the outside who doesn't own Black Ops 4 to then see the trailer, go purchase the game, and then play Dead of the Night. And you're all In personal experience, which I will admit is where this statement comes from, right? It's incredibly rare that somebody sees a single piece of content from any game and says, I want to buy that game. Buys it for a single map, a single character, whatever it is. So much so that, like, I'm the only person I know in my friend group who has bought a game based purely off of a single piece of content, and that was for Overwatch because I loved and I still love to this day Zenyatta. Zenyatta is such an amazing character in my mind. Uh, I could probably make an entire video going over his lore and what I love about him so much, but that's not for right now. Um, back to the video. Also eliminating a large percentage of players who do already own the game, but are simply unaware of it. There was a forced update, a 10 gigabyte update if memory serves, which was followed by weeks of message of the day panels and an emphasis of the map on the title screen of the game, where you get those little like panels, that the, the little rectangles that give you um, looks at each game mode. Those were all themed around Dead of the Night for weeks after its launch, so much so that I still remember the messages to this day. Even though I don't need to, even though like I, I, I know the map exists, I love the map. It's actually like, if I want to get on zombies and have a chill, enjoyable experience, Dead of the Night is where I go. Okay. Um, and I will admit that the map is maybe not designed perfectly for casual players, but also like not every map has to be, right? Like there, like at some point you need to have a difficulty curve in video games. That results in maps like Zetsubo Noshima, Garad Krovi, even Shadows of Evil to some extent, versus maps like Thur Eisendrak, The Giant, Revelations, Origins, and Mob of the Dead. Um, and you can't fault a studio for making maps that take a little bit more, you know, understanding. And as we'll see later in the video, this is actually a problem that's uh, uh, relatively important. Let's get back to the video, though. But at the end of the day, you will have a small percentage of hardcore players that will play the map regardless. When you and I log into the game, we see that Dead of the Night has released and we play it. But the fact that so many other people have been cut off from this map already is alarming. So the only people we've definitively definitively cut off after this little, you know, sort of back and forth between myself and the video are the unprovable population who didn't get the single trailer they needed to drop a hundred dollars on a game and its season pass. Um, and therefore shouldn't have access to the content. And those who theoretically didn't notice the daily messages that pop up when you load the game, that didn't notice the Dead of the Night Zombies card featuring either an epic werewolf or a, um, or like a vampire or a crimson, right? Like, there, if you owned the game, you knew about Dead of the Night's existence, whether it's from patches or from, uh, notes of the day and if you didn't own the game i mean really how many people are going to drop a hundred dollars just for a single map for a single trailer that they arguably missed out on from treyarch which caused them to lose out on a hundred dollars caused the the company to lose out on a hundred dollars so we finally load up the map and the first thing we see is of course the intro cinematic and we are introduced to our new characters yeah um, Dead of the Night didn't do great in this department either. I'm not saying I hate these characters, but what reason do I have to care about them? They're a spin-off of a spin-off. Okay, let's get this straight. Chaos is a completely separate and unique entity from Aether. 
they occur in different universes, if the entirety of Aether didn't happen, it would have no impact on the Chaos story and vice versa. Chaos is not a spin-off, it's not a copy of Aether. Beyond that, if anything, um, the Aether storyline is actually the spin-off. Primus is a spin-off of Ultimus made to patch up the story that was thoroughly ruined by installations like Transit, Buried, and Diarize, where people started hearing each other's voices commanding them to build pylons and take over the MPD, you know, replace Samantha inside of it, um, or eventually the Keeper. Uh, but, of course, that's, that's, that's an entirely separate issue and ultimately a minor criticism in the face of this video. They're not the Primus or Ultimus crew that we're familiar with. They're not even the Chaos crew that just got introduced. They're a branched off version. I, I stopped him here, hang on. Of the Chaos crew. We just got okay, there we go. We got the rest of the sentence in. Anyways, what Tim says here is basically that we've just been introduced to a new crew, and we're already getting another one? Really? Um, he, he then says that, once again, repeating the point, which I've already been over why repeating points is, um, is, is not useful, ironically, twice. Um... But, nevertheless, I have to be honest with you guys, this is not, th th this is just inaccurate. This crew on this map, in addition to, by the way, being some, being one of the funniest crews I've ever seen in Zombies, one of the crews to take themselves very lightly while still accomplishing the mission, is not a spinoff of the original Chaos crew, is not a spinoff of Bruno Shaw, um... Oof, now's a bad time to forget their names. Um, it, oh, Scarlet and uh, Diego. There we go. It's not a spin-off of those four. These are four completely different independent people, and if you pay attention to the lore of the map, these four people are actually responsible for collecting the information and delaying the inevitable capture of Scarlet's father long enough for her to get there, which is where you see the ending cutscene. You see Godfrey having been shot, you see Scarlet trying to get information from him and then eventually turning to the note that her dad had sent her in anticipation of this event, showing us how the Chaos crew got together. This is like a fundamental piece of lore explaining how these four characters aren't just random in the same way that um, they are explained in, or in the same way that our four characters in the uh Ether storyline are explained to have come together as a result of being part of international organizations with the same focus of sort of containing and understanding element 115 upon the outbreak of zombies. Um, yeah, we're just going to return to the video, though. Got introduced to a brand new crew that we already weren't huge fans of, and now we're getting introduced to... Much like Black Ops 3, this game was hated upon launch. I won't lie about that. There is, however, still a flourishing community around it, around it like I said. Um, and beyond that, the majority of the PS4 and Discord communities, which, again, are the ones that I experience, actually prefer the Chaos maps to the Aether maps. Like, they're, like, I will see the longest wait times I've seen in the community are for people who are asking to do the Aether Easter eggs or even just high rounds the Aether maps for fun. Like, if you want somebody to do the Nine Easter Egg, if you want somebody to do Dead of the Night, Voyage of Despair, Ancient Evil especially, you get responses instantly, right? Even if you're even if you're decently known for being somebody who, like, has done the Easter Egg solo, who can backpack, you still get people who are like, I'll hop in, I'll come along. Like, it'll be great. Um, and not only that, I've actually seen a fair number of people in these communities who genuinely prefer Aether to or who generally prefer, genuinely prefer the Chaos story to all of Black Ops 3's maps, which composes of almost 10 years of Aether. Another one, which are really just nameless faces that have no genuine purpose. I honestly don't remember the names of any of these characters. I think one of them is Godfried. Uh, fucking who knows? Who cares? Yeah. It's a classic move in trying to talk something down, you just sort of pretending to forget it exists, remembering only fragments of anything makes it seem worthless or less important. It's the same reason that, like, you might get offended if somebody's forgotten your name, right? Or if you opened up to somebody and they sort of just forgot everything you've said. Um, 
it, you know, you feel unheard at the very least. And the tactic is powerful when it's backed with fact. It works incredibly well if you are combining fact with the degradation of information to sort of humiliate or isolate an issue, a situation, or a person. However, this point is moot in this specific situation because it's backed with only the anecdote of, of Tim personally having forgotten the names of the characters. And, um... And of his, he, and you know, this statement is essentially saying that if I forget the names of the characters, they don't matter. Which, as I explained earlier, is far from the truth. These characters are, if we see chaos continue in Black Ops 5, what you more than likely see unfolding is that these characters are the crux of, of the chaos storyline, not the current crew. The current crew's goal is to save Alistair, right? This is the crew that's responsible for getting Alistair taken in the first place. This is the crew that's like, the it, it like, like it's the foundation, right? Like if we're writing chaos as a story, like it's the ink, it's the inspiration to act, it's the call to action that you see through the rest of the chaos story. It's again, it's far from ignorable. Yes, some of that has to do with me personally not caring enough to delve deeper into it. This is a very important sentence. The admission that you haven't delved deeper into something, that you haven't uh, done research, that you haven't put in the time to sort of generate a sense of expertise around a topic, before reviewing it should be reason enough for most people to, to look down on the review. Um, you know, upon initially hearing this, uh, I likened it to myself reviewing lipstick um a male who is you know comfortable with my gender completely confident in myself and who has mm, never worn makeup as far as i can remember right i don't have the background to speak on lipstick at all and if i ever do you should ignore me because i don't have the like i don't have the education necessary to be able to say here's what's good and here's what's bad about lipstick the important thing is that you can acknowledge what you don't have expertise or experience to speak on and to try to avoid speaking on those things, right? Back to the video. But I shouldn't have to. You know, back in the day with the Ether storyline, with our Ultimus crew, I didn't have to look deeper into it. I fell in love with their quote. You still don't have to look deeper into anything in this story. The affinity many people have for the Aether crew, at least in my observation, in my opinion, extends beyond the maps because of the layered characters, the layered pro pro plot progression, which leaves the player truly feeling like there's always something else you can pick up on, right? It's like rewatching movies. Like, each time you rewatch it, you pick up on something new, something new, something new, something new, until eventually, like, the movie just sort of, it's a different beast, and I think the chaos maps are the same, or the ether maps are the same. Over the course of the past 10 years, they've had time to really layer in the character development to sort of expand from the basic stereotypes you saw in World at War to some really deep and defined characters that you see going into the Black Ops 3 maps, having to kill their former selves with such respect, with such dignity, with such sorrow that, like, Der Eisendrach, as the sort of beginning of that um, remission is a really popular map in part because of how moving it is, right? Um, that being said, however, that layered character progression, like I said, was not introduced in the first game. In World at War, when we saw any mention of this crew, um, it, there was, it was stereotypes at best. Like, the best case scenario was stereotypes, there were stereotypical lines, stereotypical audio, like all sorts of sort of basic bland character progression. And then over the course of the next 10 years, it was built up into something magical that we can all look back upon. This statement, this review is denying chaos the right to do that, um, which in my opinion is awful. That's, I, I will obviously leave the rest. I, I'll leave it to you guys to decide whether or not it's awful on your own. But in my opinion, it is absolutely awful to sort of judge a book by its cover as hard as we've been doing here. Oh, they were funny and intriguing characters, which slowly grew over me. But what this felt like to me was, hey, here's an unimportant cast of characters who just so happen to be celebrity voiced. It doesn't really matter to me. And as a result of me not being particularly interested in these characters, I don't really care about what their mission is or what the premise of this map is. 
it's really all sort of an enigma to me. And as all right, by the way, his last sentence, which uh, again, I accidentally cut off here, was that uh, this map is an enigma to him. Now, Google defines enigma as a person or, or thing that is mysterious, puzzling, or difficult to understand. And given the assumption that the characters and by extension their interactions which form our understanding of the significance of this map, this statement should provide another reason to sort of look the other way on this review. Because if the characters are an enigma, if the sort of character of the map, the life of the map, is an enigma to a person who is supposed to be reviewing it, how can they come forth with a true understanding of the map? How can they come forth and give us accurate information and actually tell us, you know, here is what's going on, here is what's to love about the map, and here's where it can grow? As a result of that, I never did the Easter egg, and it's sort of just a chain reaction of not caring because the characters just didn't allow me to. So for the small fraction of players who managed to get past the poor marketing, we were slapped in the face with an uninteresting premise, an uninteresting set of characters, and a just a relatively boring concept. A Dracula-style mansion with vaulted ceilings, a massive statue in the center room that you can see from spawn, an absentee party host, a corrupted butler, a whole host of both new and aesthetically sound enemies, is not something that I personally consider uninteresting or relatively boring, and is a pitch that I don't think many other people could honestly say they would consider uninteresting or boring either, especially somebody who has a legitimate affinity for the Call of Duty Zombies mode and who has loved watching it develop from the post-campaign game mode that it was in World at War in Nocturne and Toten to the full-blown deep storyline we see after 10 years of Ether. All of these issues plagued Dead of the Night before we even spawned in for the very first time. Before we even began playing this map, people were either unaware of it or uninterested in it. Thanks largely to poor marketing and a long, dragged out intro cinematic featuring another new set of characters that provide us with no reason to care about them. Honestly, Treyarch's failure to properly market Dead of the Night alone is the reason for its failure. I mean, nobody was even aware of the map to begin with. It just fell out of the sky, landed on our laps, and we had no expectations. However, I hear you loud and clear. What makes a bad map is not poor marketing, it's a poor design. I mean, marketing really has nothing to do with the gameplay itself. It just disables people from getting in there in the first place. So let's put the poor marketing aside and let's Originally, this was just a sarcastic little side note, but fucking finally, we're seven minutes into a 17-minute review, and we're still talking about the marketing of the map. Again, like I said, there were Reddit leaks, there was news, there was press coverage, there was a maelstrom of, of things that happened surrounding this map that distracted Treyarch from properly marketing the map. While I won't deny that it was an issue and that it had its imperfections, there are absolutely reasons that the marketing for this map would be more padded. And again, I genuinely do not believe that it deserves seven minutes of coverage, especially out of a 17-minute map review. Let's put the characters and the story and the Easter egg aside as well. Let's look at the raw gameplay. Let's look at the map design here. Let's give Dead of the Night a fair shot because a map could be marketed poorly, a movie or anything could be marketed poorly, but still be pretty good. It doesn't really affect the quality of it. So let's give it a shot. You spawn in one of two rooms, which is an uncommon feature, but it's a feature that I really enjoy. We've seen it in the past with maps like Barucked, where your team is split up from the very beginning and have to link up in a central location. In this is inaccurate. The, this comparison is inaccurate. The divided spawn is not it it has been linked to Verruckt in press releases however its design on this map is not meant to reflect Verruckt if you pay attention to the intro cutscene at the very end of it when they are standing directly on top of the chandelier that separates the two spawns well directly below it rather in the circle which is protecting them from the cur the curse the chandelier is dropped right as part of the house's sort of transformation from this pristine place of um of social prowess into this zombie infested werewolf terrorized like sort of curse ridden land the chandelier drops the characters are forced to dive 
and logically speaking, they wouldn't all dive to the same side. So the divided spawns make sense. They, they provide some parity to the, uh, to the end of the cutscene, which is something we also see in Ancient Evil, um, where the cutscene ends with a horde of zombies in the spawn room, and the game begins logically with a horde of zombies in the spawn room. There, is, there are no barrier spawns. There's no spawn delay on round one. You can end it in five seconds because they wanted to create parity with the ending cutscene. So while it is a little nod to Verruckt, it's very, very important to mention that it also has its unique design on the map, and that based off of how relatively uh, simple it is to reconnect with the other players, the goal of this was not to provide a challenge through separate spawns, whereas the goal of Verruckt was to provide a challenge through separate spawns. Continuing. In Baruch's case, the power switch, which is the most essential component of that map. And in Dead of the Night's case, the Sentinel artifact, which acts in the same way. This adds a unique twist to the map. It splits up your team so that you have to perform at your very best ability to get to the power switch together alive. Otherwise, half of your team is going to die. We applaud Baruch for applying this, and I think we should do the same for Dead of the Night. Dead of the Night did a great job of making things interesting. Once again, I disagree with this point. I'm glad to hear that there's something positive about the map in the review, but in my opinion, at least, this is the wrong thing. In terms of gameplay, this decision has a negligible impact. If, you know, you spend a considerable amount of time working with the map, as I have, it becomes second nature to call out the number of zombie spawns you have on round one so that one person gets 750, the other person gets 1,000, and Sentinel Artifact is open with one zombie left on round one. There's essentially no spawn differentiation, and I think it's clear that that was intentional. I think it's clear that this wasn't meant to be the challenge of Verruckt, and it's not the challenge of Verruckt. It doesn't pose the same thing. While it may be like a little Easter egg, a little built-in reference to Verruckt, that's the most it is. It wasn't trying to take a to try to take trying to take a leaf out of, you know, off of Verruckt's tree. It wasn't trying to sort of pull the same string. And it's pretty important to mention that because again, this is the first gameplay feature we've mentioned this entire time and it's been assessed inaccurately. Early. After activating the Sentinel artifact, what's next, alongside grabbing miscellaneous parts, is obtaining the three tuning forks to activate Pack-a-Punch. In order to obtain these, you need to find three wisps around the map, knife them open, and feed them zombie souls. When you do that, you can look within, see the object you need to find, and go find that object. In this case, it's a noose telling me that I'd be better off hanging myself than continuing this game. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I mean, number one, that's a little bit of a low blow. But I'm, I'm going to pass that up. Uh, compared to finding six generators on Origins, four Nova Flooded Vents, uh, or even just the three teleporters on Reese, managing to get a total of 18 kills into three crystals that are very, you know, like, they're glowing, they have generous fill ranges, you know, it's a pretty simple pack-a-punch process. Like, it's 18 kills into three crystals, and then after that, you have two lockdowns and an escort okay the escort and i'll get into this more later but they all serve a purpose that's deeper than just being a stepping stone to unlocking pack-a-punch especially the noose <laughs> the noose is actually it actually leads to the escort mission which was from my assessment at least a built-in device to help newer players learn the map and grow comfortable with how to navigate it so I need to go find the noose. When I find it, Ghost Bitch pops out of thin air and leads me to the tuning fork. Oftentimes, I lose her. Where did Shoddy go? I don't know. This is one of the reasons. She's bright blue in a map that's otherwise dark. And she only goes about five feet from the player at any given point. Um, she will freeze on her path if she exceeds that distance. And, she, and her checkpoints are set up so that she never freezes in a wall. She never freezes in a floor. She always goes to a location that's clearly visible to the player as you run around the map. She also provides an incredible amount of lore into the manor itself, making the map feel overall more immersive. Uh, she talks about the history. She talks about what took place in the manor. She really, if you listen to her dialogue closely enough, actually explains how this manor specifically, this house specifically, is the one that's cursed. 
versus just any old house. Um, and this ultimately builds up to the present day Easter egg, which that in turn explains how the chaos crew was created. So like the ghost explains the foundation of the map and then you build the characters on top of that to, to make the lore a little bit deeper. And then on top of that, you have all of their actions being directly impactful of the remainder or the main body of the chaos story in Black Ops 4. So, you know, overall, this ghost is pretty important. This is why I don't like the pack-a-punch process. I fucking lose her all the time. This step is absolutely cancerous because oftentimes you don't actually know where these items are unless you're one of those people that pays attention to each and every single detail across the entire map two things here first as i already mentioned the ghost is one of the most incredible teaching tools ever seen in a zombies game her escort paths all pull the player out of the main hall out of the central body of the map uh and cause you to further explore the mansion even the ones that stay within the sort of confines of the two main hallways they loop you around they loop you through different rooms so that you can see the paths that you can move on the map so that you can see how all the doors connect all the halls connect so that you can see that the, ma the mansion is really kind of a labyrinth. Like you can see the labyrinthian feel of it. You can see these sort of unique and puzzling and very, very manipulable layout of the map to further explore the mansion. Now she also continues to reveal perks. She reveals alternate routes, like I said. And beyond that, Tim just said, you know, if you pay attention, you'll learn the map in this section. And not to get too sarcastic again, but you don't fucking say. The map doesn't spoon feed you everything, I'll admit, but again, not every map needs to tend to like a casual player experience, right? Um, that's why the things like the ghost and the two lockdowns that we'll probably hear something about here shortly are incredibly important. The vampire lockdown and, of course, the zombie clock. Uh, they give you soft introductions to mechanics that you can come to expect more of as, as the map continues. throughout the entire game i'm not one of those people there's often just random obscure items laying around that you have to keep track of which obviously for the average player is an issue it'd be different if there were one or two possible items but there are a dozen of them actually there are 20 i counted they're spread out in a series of linear paths along the map i can actually probably put a graphic of this up in the corner um there will probably be one if there's not one you can shout at me and i'll make a reddit post with a uh, a gif animated of it they're spread out in a series of linear paths that encourage exploration naturally and provide a tiered system of unlocks. The shield is crafted first, with many strategies actually enabling the shield to be crafted on round one. Uh, the parts being found in the hallways, dining hall, and library, respectively. These are, by the way, the first three rooms you sort of naturally progress to off of spawn. The process of building the shield also takes you to the first pack-a-punch crystal, with all three crystal locations being next to shield parts. Moving on, the Molten Silver is the next item to build, with again one shield part and one crystal being closely linked to the items themselves. This system doubles down on intuition a player uses when exploring a new map before pushing the player into the master bedroom where the charcoal for the uh, silver bullets is, uh, sort of introducing you that you know, you're going to need to find three piles of stuff in addition to the third Pack-a-Punch crystal to open the Pack-a-Punch. Um, and these lockdowns then proceed with a vampire lockdown which forces you out to look for perks which sounds arbitrary but realistically it'll get you out of the main body of the map it'll get you onto those same sides that the ghost is trying to get you onto actually as far as i can tell from my experience the ghost always goes to the opposite side of the lockdown perk which means that you're forced to explore both sides you're forced essentially into the other two parts you need for silver bullets creating a very, very linear, very intuitive progression where you can actually find all the parts without really looking for them just by exploring the map well and by paying attention. And of course, these parts are then linked to the side quest, to the vampire steak knife, to the impaler candles, so that as you explore the entire map, there's a very like there's a very natural sense of reward for progressing out of the spawn room for picking up that weapon off the wall for moving beyond just hitting box for actually opening pack a punch there's a reward system for all of those things and it's incredible and then what it ends up turning into every single time is a scavenger hunt which is irritating especially for people who aren't even familiar with the map or the game yesterday when i was playing this map i got a newspaper scroll as one of the items 
that's a final will. By the way, it says final will right on it. Um, that, that's really all I have to say about this point. It's clearly, clearly labeled final will. I had no fucking idea where that was, and I literally just quit the game. I didn't want to go find it. So this step in particular is nothing but trouble. The other two steps are pretty simple. One of them, you are directed towards a specific god statue. You kill a bunch of vampires and are rewarded with one of the tuning forks. And in the other one, you're directed to one of three clocks. You activate it and are given the other tuning fork. When you have all three, you can then enter the forest. And you're met with this motherfucker. We'll get to Big Head here. Remember the soft introductions to new mechanics that I've been mentioning as a theme in this video? The soft introduction to vampires through the uh, perk lockdown. The soft introductions to the shield parts, to all the buildables on this map. Here's another one. The long animations, the, the wound up animations of the, vamp or of the um, werewolf darting along the trees before it properly falls down onto the ground. Show you how the wolf comes into the map. Show you that if you pay attention to the bounds of the map, you can actually see the werewolves from every single one of their spawn locations dropping in from the roof into the main hall. You know, where really wherever they come from, you can see them hopping out from among the trees in the graveyard. And also, beyond that, they give you a pretty big open area. They give you a big, easy circle right there to kite the werewolf around so that you can pay attention to its attack patterns. You can take a second to actually see, like, okay, when it crouches down, it's going to jump. That kind of thing. And then y you can get used to dodging it and kiting it to the point where, I'll be honest with you, the first time I got one in an actual train of zombies, it wasn't an issue. Because, like, this soft intro showed me, okay, this is what I need to expect. This is how much damage it takes. And... It's a wonderful mechanic. It's better than just outright telling the player these things like World War II zombies did, you know, basically giving you every Easter egg step as an objective marker. And it's not as impossible as some of the Aether maps where there's just no guidance where, you know, on Zetsubo you have to figure out to use anywhere but here to get one of the cogs. There's no logical, like, there's, there's no intuitive way to figure that out. You just need to brute force your way to it accidentally. Uh... But then again, back to the video, let's continue. Or later. My point is, pack-a-punching on this map can be easy, depending on what items you get, but usually it's very irritating. Pack-a-punching this map can be an absolute nightmare. It's either look up a YouTube tutorial or go on a scavenger hunt if you don't know where one of the very many items are. I'm not gonna lie, at times it can be fun. I just walk around pretending I'm Sherlock Holmes trying to solve this fucked up puzzle grab a piece here, grab a piece there. Sometimes it works out and it's beautiful. I love that concept. When this is as far into the map as you look, I agree. I thoroughly agree it's annoying. When you just say, I've got a random escort and two lockdowns, that sounds pretty boring. That sounds pretty bland. Like, why not just give me Pack-A-Punch if we all know I can already do the escorts every time I play the game? Especially because the escort can't even be hurt by zombies, so it's literally impossible to fail. Um... When it's viewed, however, like I mentioned earlier, as a logical tool for introducing mechanics and for rewarding player intuition, it's a masterful mechanic. It's an intentionally and geniusly implemented mechanic, which balances the lore hardcore players love with the progression that everybody else wants to see in a map that, that allows them to sort of reach that point of being able to just enjoy the map. But at the end of the day, what it always ends up turning into is a tedious scavenger hunt that not everybody has the patience for, especially beginners, especially for casuals. The majority of the community are casuals after all. And speaking of many items, oh my god, on Dead of the Night, you have to find what feels like a thousand different parts. You have the three tuning forks, you have the shield parts, you have the silver bullet parts, you have all of the upgradable parts for the Alistair's Foley, and there's a lot of other side quests that you can choose to do, like getting the vampire stakes and other things that require grabbing a lot more parts. It doesn't seem like a lot when I list them off, but let me tell you, it feels like an endless search. Now, it'd be one thing if you only had to grab a couple of the pieces for survival, but you need the vast majority of them. If you don't have a shield on this map, you're fucked. You are fucked without a shield. You really need silver bullets to kill those werewolves. Otherwise, good luck, man. They spawn in pretty frequently, and they are bull- I'm gonna stop here to just reiterate that there are 20 parts in total. For Pack-A-Punch, for the shield, for the first, second, and third tiers of the unique wonder weapon, the steak knife, the impaler, silver bullets. 
that was what eight items nine items 20 items is completely reasonable to pick up for that many unique uh, parts especially when you get the three for pack-a-punch you get the three for the shield you get the six for silver bullets so that's 12 already and you get one more you get basically one free uh alistair's upgrade piece in the library just for playing the map intuitively so you get over half of those parts just for taking time to explore the map a little bit before you hate on it um and a lot of them are even visible from spawn like if you open the first door on the map you can already see about a third of the part locations for those parts it's not it's it's far from being unbalanced and quite frankly it's actually again like i said very intuitive and very very rewarding for paying attention to the map bullet sponges the nosferatus if you want to kill those efficiently the vampire snake is almost necessary so the fact that there are so many parts combined with the fact that you have to grab them really rubs the player the wrong way it, it rubs you the wrong way tim i'm sorry to attack you personally here but you as a single player cannot and should not speak for other players this generalization is a clear attempt to indoctrinate other people specifically you're following into your sort of school of thought this is actually defined as um a sort of symbol a red flag of cult-like behavior but i'm not of course accusing you of trying to create a cult or of accusing the followers of tim hansen of being a cult i'm just saying this is there are, there are, is known psychological research that's been put into this specific tactic and it's and found that it can be very problematic and very very effective um and the easiest way to do this, of course, is to just default to including other people in something that's an opinion. If you state an opinion as a fact and state it as a fact that other people know, those of us who are weaker willed, those of us who aren't quite as smart, are much more likely to just go with it and adopt it as our own opinion. That being said, let's continue with the video. In theory, the more parts, the more things to build, the better. But in reality, what it ends up creating are disgruntled casual players. I mean, casual players hop on this map and they go, Look how many fucking parts I have to grab. I don't know where any of this is. I just have to walk along the border of the map holding square or X. And what casual players end up doing instead of going on this seemingly endless search is just quitting. As you stated earlier, that's what you did. It certainly isn't what I did. And the majority of the nearly 400 people who I personally have played zombies with who also didn't quit this map upon seeing the number of parts. I will admit it did look a little bit overwhelming, but it also looked intriguing because with that many parts, how much potential do you really have? Um... I've played the map with most of them over the course of the roughly 100 matches I've completed, and honestly, I can say that the only ones who struggled were those who didn't have a basic understanding of positioning of how to survive in the game mode. It wasn't a map-specific issue. It was people who would down in the arena on 9, people who would down on the poop deck on Voyage, constantly had an issue with this map too, and it wasn't because of the parts, it was because of the basic survival mechanics. Why play this map when you can go play another one? That's a lot simpler. So, an easy experience isn't always a fun one. Okay? As someone who's gotten used to the priority changes brought about by catalysts, that being, by the way, shoot them first, um, I can genuinely say that Black Ops 3 has lost its shine in my eyes. Even Shadows of Evil, which is my favorite map of all time. It feels considerably more monotonous than Ancient Evil or Dead of the Night, specifically because there aren't catalysts. Specifically because if I have zombies, I shoot the zombies. It doesn't matter what order I shoot them in, they just need to be shot. Whereas in Black Ops 4, if you see a blue catalyst, you are supposed to be worried. You are supposed to turn around. You are supposed to shoot that zombie. And that's a beautiful force and priority change. And it's a little more difficult. I will agree, catalyst being like a specific example of a difficulty increase. But it keeps you on your toes, and ultimately it makes the entire experience feel more engaging. It makes high rounds especially feel a lot less like, okay, I've been running in circles doing the same thing for three hours now. A little bit of difficulty never, never made anything worse, and I really don't think it should be counted against this map for that reason either. What we have so far is a pack-a-bunch process that oftentimes turns into a scavenger hunt in which nobody wants to participate in, alongside a million different pieces you need to grab for your survival. Not a great combination. The majority of players 
don't like this map for that exact reason. And here is the incoming argument, which is, Tim, there are other maps out there, such as Origins, for example, that have a million different parts to grab. Yet you applaud those maps, and those maps are considered the best. What's the difference? Well, the difference is, in Origins, I'm getting four ultimate stabs that essentially deal infinite damage. Don't forget that the only stabs that actually deal infinite damage or kill zombies infinitely are wind and ice. The fire staff never really falls off against panzers, but eventually becomes useless against zombies. And I'm pretty sure there's a point at which the lightning staff can only kill one zombie per charge shot, which is ridiculously weak. Keeping that in mind, all four of the fully upgraded um, Alistair's Folly shots insta-kill forever. The Alistair's Annihilator shots all deal infinite damage, and though two of them don't kill instantly, those being the green sh or the uh, sort of like yellow green shot and the blue shot, the ice tornado or the the two that are part of the chaos theory actually, they both CC impacted zombies until their eventual death, so that those zombies don't hit you unless you literally run directly into them. Right, and then on dead of the night, you're given an Alistair's Foley. Huge discrepancy there. I mean, the Alistair's Foley is a unique wonder weapon. I personally enjoy it, but it's nothing in comparison. When I do all of that work and put in all of that effort on Origins, I'm rewarded greatly. Unless you wasted your time riding the tank for the electric staff, that is. For it. When I do the same on Dead of the Night, I'm usually just slapped in the face. One thing I really do enjoy about Dead of the Night is the atmosphere. I mean, is there another one out there like Dead of the Night? Being in this giant mansion filled with different monsters and ghouls i mean it's i agree it's great i personally love it now you've already mentioned earlier in the video that you think it failed so you've kind of contradicted yourself here but that's beyond the point i could do a rant almost as long as 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 the segment about marketing in this video on the aesthetics of the graveyard section of this map alone i could probably talk about the map as a whole the aesthetics for almost as long as this entire review video is going to go because the aesthetics the enemy blending the color palette it's all wonderfully done. I absolutely adore it. But again, that's a personal opinion. You're welcome to disagree with me. It's, it's a really unique idea. Aesthetically, it's quite beautiful. It gives you a very vibrant, warm feel. Warm? Really? The inside of the map is mostly gray or gray-toned with vaulted ceilings and statues looming around literally every corner, including hollowed-out suits of armor that you eventually figure out are possessed as you progress through the Easter egg. If anything, it was set up to be a stereotypical horror flick mansion, a Scooby-Doo style experience. I personally am hard pressed to find anything that I would describe as either warm or vibrant about the map in its current color palette. Feeling on the inside, everything looks very nice, and on the outside, you have a very spooky forest in contrast. I think the color scheme is fantastic, and it really does give off a nice spooky zombies vibe. It's not scary, but it gives you that perfect level of creepy, but also very comfortable. I love that in a zombies map. The atmosphere is very well done. And on top of that, the design actually flows surprisingly well. You would think that a map like this, where it's just a giant building, wouldn't flow this seamlessly. It's actually very well done. You sort of just drift in and out of the rooms without even thinking about it, and that's when you know that a map is very well designed. I actually have no complaints when it comes to the design itself. Dead of the Night actually did that correctly, which is a big thing to do correctly, so I'll applaud it for that. I agree. I agree. I really do. And it's unfortunate, because... This is all that he says about the design. This is where it stops, which is saddening to me. Because as I've already explained, the, the design of the map is not just for, you know, game flow. Not purely for, you know, the player's mobility. It systemically introduces each of 20 buildable parts so that there's no scavenger hunt, so that there's no impossible chore so that there's no staring out behind the church and saying, well, how the fuck do I get this thing when the tank is already in the church and it's going to be nowhere near there for a while, for at least two cooldowns. With that all being said, there is one thing. There is one particular reason why I can't stand Dead of the Night. There is one driving force as to why Tim doesn't play Dead of the Night, and that's the Nosferatus. 
these motherfuckers, vampires, Nosferatus, whatever you want to refer to them as, Treyarch, why did you add them in the map? They make sense aesthetically in terms of atmosphere. You know, vampires in a big scary monster house. It all makes sense to me, right? And, you know, maybe they would work if there weren't so many of them. But Jesus, man, there's a thousand of these motherfuckers crawling in the map every single Unfortunately for Tim, this video came out in December of 2019, almost a year after the map itself came out, and about eight months after the patch came out that nerfed the spawn rate and health of the Nosferatu. Uh, while they did initially scale up a lot faster than the Catalyst, and they initially, I, I will admit, they were overwhelming on release, they've since been nerfed to the point where it actually makes the Easter Egg and the Steak Knife harder to complete because there are so few of them. I mean, the the steak knife, you used to have it round 7, round 8, round 9 if you played the map correctly. Now you have it round 15 if you're lucky. Or if you don't use other easter egg steps to force spawn in vampires to fill it. Um, if this video was released when Dead of the Night was released, that point would have made complete sense. I would have had no argument with it, and I couldn't have argued with it even to this day because it was accurate for the time the video was released. But now it's statistically incorrect based on the number of spawns you get each round, which in a four-player game, by the way, you get two, sometimes three vampires between the time you open Pack-A-Punch and round 15. Two to three. Let that sink in. That's nothing, especially when they have the health of every other vermin enemy in this game, which is like they can reasonably killed and be killed in three or four uh, well-aimed headshots from most weapons, one shot from shotguns, one shot from snipers. Back to the video. Around, they're absolutely everywhere. At every single turn, one of these motherfuckers are standing there. They jump on you, they sc The only ones that jump are the Crimsons, a more difficult variant which begins spawning naturally on round 35, giving the player more than enough time to set up. I'm actually interested that Tim had this issue because even on launch, they didn't spawn until round 35 naturally. You can force spawn a single one in earlier as part of the Alistair's upgrade quest. But there are a lot of steps involved in that that one who is not okay with doing a quote-unquote scavenger hunt for parts just straight up wouldn't experience. So... I don't know how he had this issue, genuinely. But... Again, the Crimson is a late-game, stronger variant of the regular Nosferatu. Um, and it even has an intro fight like all the other enemies. Like I've been saying earlier, as part of upgrading, as part of the upgrade to Alistair's Annihilator, you actually need to go and force spawn a single one in, in what's, again, a pretty large open loop, so that you can essentially run it around in circles and figure out what its mechanics are at you there's blood all over your screen you can't see properly they lunge at you they're quick they're nimble they're hard to shoot sometimes they're literally denizens but bigger the comparison to denizens here is awful i mean half the time if you shot denizens and they died they would still jump onto your head even the gavs even the gavs took like three hits to kill them they inhibited mobility they would get you killed, basically, on high rounds because the zombies sprinted faster than you could move with one on your head. In this game, the Nosferatu share a set of features that clearly telegraph when they're going to attack, including but not limited to their eyes changing color. Um, they also have lower health, and they have an increased um, weakness to silver bullets. It's not as big a difference as, as you see with the uh, werewolves, but they take more damage from the silver bullets. Beyond that, there are two in-map features, those being the Impaler and the Steak Knife, which both kill them infinitely, and both are honestly pretty easy to obtain. Like, you can obtain both of them with minimal setup over the course of natural gameplay. And again, they both one-shot vampires forever. So if you have a problem with vampires, either build the ranged version in the Impaler or the melee version in the Steak Knife, and you'll be set. They even one-shot the Crimsons and stronger. Denizens were deemed as the most annoying boss of all time. These are just denizens that are bigger. So effectively, the, the Nosferatus are the worst boss zombie of all time. No. 
a huge part of the issue, as I already mentioned, with the denizens came from the balancing. There was not an in-map counter. They inhibited movement with the attacks. While Crimson's completely stop movement with their attacks, or near completely stop movement, I will admit, they give a zombie blood effect for six seconds afterwards. So their natural no regen debuff goes away, and zombies will ignore you while your health starts regenerating. Um, beyond that, again, there are plenty of counters. They're not hard to build. I mean, they're not hard to build, and they, they aren't as easy to manage, I will admit, as like running a panzer around in a circle while taking pot shots at its clearly exposed helmet over a group of zombies. They, they, they stay in trains. They're easy enough to control, provided one has a basic understanding of their mechanics and of the mechanics of the map that they're in. And they pale in comparison to the horror show that, that the denizens were. I mean, these, it's like, it's like a con. it's like having, mm, how do I describe this? I don't have an STI, I don't have any sexual transmitted infections or diseases, but I imagine that this is what it would feel like. Just a thought, just a side comment here, most sexually healthy people don't need to confirm that they don't have an STI before making a joke about it. Seriously, genuinely think that the Nosferatu's ruined Dead of the Night. For a lot of people out there, too, this is not an unpopular opinion. Ask a lot of people out there that the Nosferatu's... That could just be the title of this. Nosferatu's fucking ruined it. Without silver bullets, the werewolves are difficult to shoot down, but they don't spawn in nearly as frequently, and I don't see them as much of an issue. I think they're pretty cool. I think they add a minor chaos to this map. The Catalyst Zombies, as many of you guys know, I'm not a huge fan of either. I because the next bit's acknowledged as an opinion in the original video, I will try not to tear into it as hard as I've torn into some other points made over the course of this review. I think they add nothing and take away a lot. There it is. Catalysts add nothing and take away a lot. Now, I'm genuinely interested. There's no sarcasm here. I'm genuinely interested in a review of what exactly the Catalysts add and take away in Tim's opinion, and also, honestly, in the opinion of a bunch of other Zombies communities members. Mostly because I personally, like I said earlier, think they add a lot more than they take away. They force you to change target priority, but not to the huge scale that a panzer or a werewolf does. They force you to just kind of like, instead of looking up, seeing a train and shooting a train, they force you to run the circle a little farther so that you can single out a, a one zombie to remove. They also add a unique and, in my opinion, incredibly busted effect when combined with a double pack-a-punch abilities, which... Uh, you can Google if you want to know about it, but uh, if you hit a catalyst with the right reactive ammo type, it'll explode and kill the entire train instantly, giving you the points for it. The Nosferatu's, however, they take the cake. Absolute worst boss in Call of Duty Zombies history. Fucking terrible in every way. So, the boss zombies, sorry to lump you in werewolves, but the Dead of the Night boss zombies take away so much of this experience. It's really just the quantity of them that ruins this map for me. I feel as though people don't talk about it enough, but the Nosferatu's to me are the driving force as to why I personally don't play, and it's just another one of the many reasons as to why Dead of the Night isn't a very good map. While this is something that you personally dislike, it's unfair to say that it's the reason a larger audience doesn't play the map. Um, in my humble opinion, at least, and as can be evidenced by multiple other YouTubers who are being called out for the same thing, multiple other stars even, it is unfair to project your own opinions onto an audience just because you have one, to project your own motives, to project your own needs, essentially, onto your audience just because you have an audience. It's unquestionably abuse of the influence generated by having subs on YouTube, by having, excuse me, a following as the lead singer of a band, let's say by being any other sort of influential media personality, one of the worst things you can do is start manipulating your audience for you know, personal gain or even for sort of personal, um, personal edification. And as you can see in extreme cases, like with uh, Onision, this is a free ticket to having my video uh, cut down, by the way, but as you can see with Onision even, um, a, a, a consistent abuse of audience will actually lead to a degradation in the people who trust you because eventually people will start, you know, noticing these things. Um, I'm not trying to be ominous here, by the way. It's just... It, 
in my opinion, is an abusive audience to to extrapolate your opinion onto a larger group of people without a poll, without some other form of statistical evidence. Black Ops 4 Zombies has a lot of issues that have nothing to do with Dead of the Night and has everything to do with the game mechanics themselves. I've made a video talking extensively of just that. But what Dead of the Night did was ruin Black Ops 4 Zombies going forward. You see, DLC 1, like I said, is the ultimate first impression. They didn't even market it. DLC 1 fell flat, and then DLC 2 fell flat, and then 3, and then 4. It was sort of a domino effect. On a different note, the COD Zombies Reddit generally agrees that Ancient Evil, part of DLC 2, is one of the great maps. While maybe not the same pedestal as Mob or Origins, it's widely accepted to be on the better side of Treyarch maps. Meaning, of course, that it certainly didn't fall flat. And DLC 3 and 4 didn't have anything to do with the Chaos story. They really shouldn't be factored into the opinions on whether or not the Chaos story fell flat, because they were Aether maps. If you're going to use... The, if you're going to use the entire DLC season against Dead of the Night here, it, it should be mentioned that two of those maps were actually released as part of the beloved Aether story and were received worse than the Chaos maps. Um, and, of course, these last couple of maps were, were Treyarch bending trying to provide pan fan service to those who couldn't accept that Revelations was where Blundell wanted to end the Aether story and start something different, which is probably a huge part of why they came out seeming so, like, lukewarm. You have to get the first DLC right, otherwise people's attention span disappears and people leave for other games. Since this is the 13th time the quote-unquote paramount importance of DLC 1 is mentioned, I feel completely justified in repeating the point that while this may have happened to you, the Zombies community on BO4 is still flourishing to this day, well over a year after the final map was released, and even in the face of the popularity of Modern Warfare and Doom Eternal, the two most noteworthy FPS games released between BO4 and the time of writing the script, March 2020 for those wondering. And that's what happened with Black Ops 4 Zombies, and that's what happened with Dead of the Night. Now, you can have a good quality map without good marketing, but the map itself wasn't fantastic either. And that is how Dead of the Night ruined Black Ops 4 Zombies. It's not my least favorite map of all time, and I realize there are some hardcore fans and people that would argue that it is the best map in the game. And I'm open to that discussion, but... The belaboring of issues with marketing characters and a little bit of complexity would indicate that you actually don't want to have this discussion, but instead want to convince a large enough part of your audience to hate the map that you can let them loose on anyone who dares to disagree with you. Again, another sort of shady manipul- or another tactic that could potentially be sort of shady or manipulative, but again, that's my personal speculation, my personal take on this. I don't have, you know, actual proof to back that, it's just kind of my observation, so uh, take it with a grain of salt, if you will. But what's not up for discussion is that Dead of the Night shot Black Ops 4 in the foot. Anyways, this statement was made based purely on personal opinion created over what honestly sounds like less than a dozen total attempts at playing the map. Not only is that an invalid platform to claim expertise on the map and to present a review as professional, but it is ludicrous to make a review which is presented in a professional manner beyond that the individual who leaked everything uh, shot Black Ops 4 in the foot, if anything, not Dead of the Night, the mechanical changes, or any incredible or the incredible design. Sorry to deviate from the, the standard and dive, what, dive into what is purely a personal opinion, but I was blown away by seeing vampires, werewolves, and a fucking pegasus in zombies. I mean, honestly, I never expected to see any of those things in zombies, much less the Greco-Roman pantheon or a creative take on its mythos. That being said, I absolutely love the creativity of these new maps. I hope you guys enjoyed. Please leave a like on the video if you did. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss the next episode. I realize a lot of these Black Ops 4 analysis videos are negative. They're not all negative. In fact, of the four I did, two of them, half of them, were positive. False positivity is worse than honest negativity, and for that matter, generalizing to make a masterpiece of level design seem like a waste of space is equally, equally awful. But I really appreciate you listening through, even if you disagreed. I gotta go. Thank you guys so much. Likewise, I, I appreciate you guys listening to uh, my take on this, my sort of rebuttal to this review. 
I, however, am not concerned with whether you agree or disagree. I'm more interested in uh, my argument. What holes do you see in it? What problems do you have with it? What are your opinions? What can you bring to the table to expand or detract from it? Comment below and remember that this has been Obscenity. Thanks for watching.